Located on the east coast of Vancouver Island, Nanaimo lies in the traditional territory of the Snunema First Nation. Part of the Coast Salish Territory, the region is home to incredible natural beauty. Nanaimo is defined by Mount Benson, the long coastline, and the Nanaimo River estuary, the largest estuary on Vancouver Island. There is a huge variety of parks and trails to explore in the forest, up mountains, along the coast, and around lakes, creating an abundance of outdoor recreational opportunities for people of all skill levels. Hi, I'm Patty, and I love hiking. I love getting outdoors, taking pictures, I love observing wildlife, and I just like being out there and getting some exercise. It's just a great thing to do. Yeah, hi, I'm Matt Kello, and uh, I grew up on southern Vancouver Island, and I love getting out and adventuring. I uh, like biking and running a kayak down a river, and I like hiking a lot too, and I'm happy to be co-hosting today with Patty. While enjoying the great outdoors, it's important to ask ourselves, how can we keep ourselves and others safe while on the trails? How can we be sure we're using the trails responsibly? And how can we promote proper etiquette while we share the trails with others? Today we'll answer these questions for you and introduce you to some knowledgeable and fascinating people. And we'll also showcase some of the best trails and parks in our area. We hope that the video inspires you to get outside and enjoy the beauty of nature in a safe and responsible way. Now let's go for a hike. Sounds like a plan. Planning a hike begins before you ever set foot on the trail. Careful preparation will make sure that you have a safe, comfortable, and fun hike. First, research your hike thoroughly before you set off. Read trail descriptions, trip reports, and have a look at the weather forecast. Study the route on your map and identify emergency exit points along your path. Decide on a plan B and maybe a plan C in the event that the hike doesn't go as planned. For example, you've got group members that are going slower than expected. It's really important to be honest with yourself and know your capabilities. Choose a route that's right for you and your fitness level and your level of experience. Things to consider are the change in elevation, the season, the type of terrain you'll be going across, and the length of the hike. If you're hiking with a group, you must make sure that you travel at the speed of the slowest member. The saying is, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Once you've decided on a route, complete a trip plan that details where you're going. Who is in your group? How many are in your group? The equipment you have, your expected return time, and what to do if you don't return as planned. Leave your trip plan with a responsible person who is not going with you. The trip plan contains vital information to assist authorities searching for you in the event of an emergency. Remember, if no one knows you're missing, no one will be looking for you. And make sure to check the weather and pack accordingly. The weather on the west coast can change in an instant. You should always have rain gear in your pack, no matter what the weather expected. And remember to dress in layers. This allows a hiker to adjust to changing conditions and activity levels. Nobody expects that they're going to get into trouble in the outdoors, but a change in weather, a uh, lack of equipment, a lack of knowledge around how to use that equipment, or an injury uh, can change any situation into something more serious. Make sure you don't leave out that planning step. Anyone who has ever been in a dangerous situation on the trail will tell you it happens suddenly and with very little warning. To minimize risk, make sure you bring the 10 essentials with you in your backpack on your adventure. A flashlight or headlamp with extra batteries. If you take longer than expected on the trail, hiking by flashlight certainly beats staying overnight outside. Weatherproof fire making material, for example a flint or some other device to generate a spark. Dry kindling, or you can use cotton balls or fatwood. And always make sure you have waterproof matches or a lighter in your pack. You'll need a knife or a multi-tool for repairs and problem solving and to help with the fire. Sun protection with a hat, sunglasses and sunscreen is important too. 
Extra food and water, because it's vital to keep your mind and body well-nourished and hydrated. Extra clothing is a must. The weather can shift in an instant on the coast or in the mountains. A combination of wet, cold, and wind can be very dangerous. Having proper rain gear and removable layers is really important. An emergency blanket, a small tarp, or a bivy sack to protect you from the environment in case you happen to get caught out for some reason. A map, preferably a topographical map, and a compass, especially in the backcountry. And make sure you know how to use these things. A GPS is a useful tool to have. And mapping apps on your cell phone are great and are becoming the norm. But be aware your phone has limited battery life and doesn't do well in the wet and cold. A whistle and a signaling mirror or brightly colored cloth in case you do become lost or separated from your group. And a first aid kit is essential with a variety of dressings, bandages and antiseptics, tweezers, slings, afterbite. The key to this again is to know how to use your first aid kit. Should you be lucky enough to encounter wildlife while on the trail, be it large or small, you should always give it space and treat it with caution. Every animal you see should be considered wild and therefore unpredictable. The best thing that uh, someone can do to avoid wildlife on the trail is travel in groups. Bears are scared of you and so no, p noise that people make will scare off bears. More people, more noise, less bears. Have your bear spray on you. You'll have it on your hip and not on your backpack. So a lot of people make the mistake of having it with them on their backpack. They put it down for lunch or to go to the bathroom and they don't have it with them. Another concern is getting lost, which can happen to even the most experienced hikers and even on well-marked trails. It's why our local volunteer search and rescue organizations are so important. You can be prepared by leaving a trip plan, knowing important skills, and carrying essential equipment, as this can really improve your experience of the outdoors and it can even save your life. If you find yourself in need of help, specially trained volunteer search and rescue members such as myself may be requested by the RCMP to help. Just like any other emergency, you need to dial 911 or notify authorities by activating your emergency beacon. Same goes for a family member or friend who is waiting for your return. If you've missed your return time, it is important that they notify the RCMP with your trip plan. When RCMP activate a search and rescue team, there's no cost to you for our service. You can help our team out by remembering a couple of important things. When you're lost or injured, it is important to make the call sooner rather than later, as this can affect the time it takes for you to get help. It can take several hours from activation for a SAR team to be able to reach you, depending on remoteness of location, nightfall, and weather conditions. Also, what's very important to remember while you're waiting for help is to stay put, warm, dry, and make yourself visible to searchers who are looking for you. Keeping these straightforward tips in mind every time you go out exploring will help you be better prepared and will significantly increase your chances of returning home safely. One of the key rules of responsible outdoor recreation is to leave no trace. We want to leave natural habitats as undisturbed as possible to preserve them and to make them better for other people to enjoy. As good stewards of the trail, it's important to know the seven principles. Plan ahead and prepare. Know the area you're visiting and any special concerns or regulations regarding it. Prepare for all weather conditions and schedule your trip to avoid times of high use. Repackage food to minimize waste and use a GPS, a map and or compass to eliminate the need for ma marking paint, rock cairns or flagging. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. Examples of these include established trails and campsites, rock, gravel, dry grass, or snow. When in popular areas, concentrate use on existing trails and campsites. 
walk single file in the middle of the trail, even when it's wet and muddy. Focus activity in areas where vegetation is absent. Dispose of waste properly. Pack garbage out, including food scraps and toilet paper. Leave what you find. In order to preserve the past, examine but do not touch cultural or historic structures and artifacts. Leave rocks, plants, and other natural objects as you find them. As the saying goes, take only pictures and leave only footprints. Minimize campfire impacts. Where fires are permitted, use established fire rings, fire pans, or mound fires. Keep fires small. Only use sticks from the ground that can be broken by hand. Burn all wood and coals to ash, put out campfires completely, and then scatter the coals and ashes. Respect wildlife. Observe wildlife from a distance. Do not follow or approach them. Never feed animals. People should control pets at all times, or leave them at home. I think trail etiquette uh, has to be combined with common sense. Um, I think if hikers are on known mountain bike trails, they definitely need to be very observant um, and keep their ears open. and. Uh, not have earphones in and that sort of thing. And I think if mountain bikers are riding on what are more known as hiking trails, I think we need to be very respectful of the area, not skidding, um, slowing down when we encounter people, whether we're going downhill or not, uh, and just be courteous. Uh, the better relationship the different trail users have, the more access all trail user groups will have to the trails in the, in the local area. Imagine if your entire neighborhood were to just start walking haphazardly through your garden every day, oblivious to the flowers, the grasses, and the shrubs that you had planted. Now imagine your neighbors just aren't walking, but they're riding mountain bikes, horses, and all-terrain vehicles. The reality is this is what's happening in some of our parks and protected areas to our trails. It takes vigilance to preserve the natural state of our parks for future generations. We all know just how many new outdoor enthusiasts are coming to Vancouver Island, and everyone wants to experience the great Canadian outdoors. Seems like there are way more people out, you know, enjoying themselves on the trails, whether that's hiking or, or mountain biking or any of the other ways that people enjoy the trails. And because there's more of us out there doing that, I think we have to be sort of mindful about how we're, how we're enjoying the trails and uh, making sure that we're not degrading the land that the trails are passing through. We, we have had the sense of a sort of boundless frontier for a long time, but with today, you know, I, I can travel around the world in no time at all. I can certainly get from here to the west coast of the island easily. And so that boundless area that we have in our, in our minds, in our imagination, really isn't boundless. And we have to really be thoughtful about what we're doing there so that we can enjoy all the values that the land supports. What can we do to help out in this? Well, in terms of hiking, um, we can greatly minimize the impact on our parks and trails uh, simply by considering the choices we make when we're out in, in uh, nature. Um, there are some guidelines we can follow uh, to ensure we'll be able to enjoy these values, uh, not just now in our parks and trails, but for generations to come. So in terms of principles, one would be to stay on designated trails and avoid trail braiding. Trails have been designed with erosion, sedimentation and runoff in mind, and to minimize the impact on fauna and flora. Trail braiding is when several new paths are made where only one existed before. For whatever reason, trail users decide to avoid an obstacle or take a shortcut and carve out another path. This leads to trail widening and increases rates of erosion. Some of the wildflowers, especially those in the Alpine, can take 20 or 30 years to grow back if trampled on. 
For reasons like this, it's important to stay on the trails and avoid trail braiding. If the trail is in a poor state of repair, don't create a new one. Contact the land manager and make them aware of the issue and inquire about a remedy. Another principle would be to respect signs and about trail and road closures. When you encounter them, remember that they aren't there to ruin your day, but to achieve a land management goal like protecting the surrounding area from further damage and maybe to keep you safe. Uh, the third principle would be, uh, you know, it's a simple one, but avoid walking around puddles. When you walk around a puddle, it leads to trail, widening of the trail. Instead, invest in a pair of gaiters, a good pair of boots to help keep your feet and shoes dry and walk through the puddles. A fourth principle would be to make sure your gear is clean before hiking in sensitive areas to avoid bringing in foreign seeds or pollen. And uh, when I hike, I like to cover up for protection from the sun and stinging insects. And when you use bug sprays and lotions to do this, uh, make sure you're using eco-friendly ones uh, so that you're not introducing harmful chemicals into the natural environment. I, I guess if I was to sum it up, it all boils down to preparation. Uh, research the trail and what to expect and come prepared for those conditions. Respect the trails and signage, communicate issues to the land manager, and remember everything we do affects the natural world we're walking through. Make your decisions with nature in mind. There are many people out enjoying the trails, which is wonderful. Whether you're sharing the trails with mountain bikers, equestrian users, or fellow hikers, here are some general guidelines around etiquette. Review the trail's guidelines. Always read the rules and regulations of the area you're hiking in. These may limit group size and whether pets are allowed. There may also be notices posted on the trailhead, such as wildlife sightings or trail closures. If you see someone, if you're a hiker and you're going up something that's really steep and you've got a mountain biker coming down, way easier for you just to step off and, um, and let them descend safely. So just, you know, being, using common sense, I think, and we're all out here to enjoy it. So yeah, be nice. Stay on the trail. If the trail is narrow, hike single file and always keep to the path. Take breaks. When taking a break, find a spot where others can pass unobstructed. Durable surfaces like gravel, rocks, and benches are the best option. Watch your volume. Most people spend time in nature to enjoy the peace and quiet and listen to the songs of birds, the wind in the trees, or moving water. If you're chatting with your hiking buddies, keep your voice down. Also, turn off your cell phone and avoid playing music out loud. Nature has its own music. Enjoy it. It's important when you have your dogs off leash that they come back when called so that they're not chasing wildlife, walking all over sensitive environmental areas, um, running up to people who might not be dog friendly or might be afraid of dogs, other dogs that might be afraid of dogs. It's important to have them under control for their safety as well as everybody else's. In conclusion, we hope you will be out on the trails soon, enjoying a safe, comfortable and fun experience. And we trust that you will foster a healthy respect for our natural world in order to recognize and reduce our impact on it. We wish you good hiking.